Okay, good evening. Welcome to our second installment of a White Coat and Jeans, The Life of a Medical Geneticist. You will hear from several medical geneticists at different career levels, and we hope to give you a snapshot of what you can expect if you're interested in learning more about this field. I'm Deborah, I'm Dr. Deborah Murray, and along with Professor Fernback, we co-direct the Office of Community Engagement and Diversity. And it is our goal to bring these opportunities so that you can learn more about genetics and genomics career paths. We will have breakout sessions at the end and we ask that you answer our survey. We'll put the survey in chat. So hopefully you will learn a lot today. So first, I just wanna tell you about the programs that we have in the Department of Molecular Human Genetics. We are at Baylor College of Medicine. I don't think I said that. And for the medical students, the top two, and I can't tell you what colors those are. I know they're different colors, but they are directed to medical students who are interested in learning more about this career field. So you can have an elective if you are a student at a different institution and you can come here for uh, an elective. For Baylor students, they have the opportunity to take the medical research pathways. We also are interested in increasing underrepresented groups in the field. So there are two opportunities, the Medical Genetics Diversity Visiting Students Program and the Clinical Research Education Training Program. And for those who are about to graduate and are interested in residency programs, there are three here listed and also there are fellowship programs. And we'll have the link to our site where you can find more information about these training um, uh, areas. So first we'll have Dr. Brendan Lee. Great, thank you. Deborah. Um, I'm, uh, welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to be here to talk with you. Um, I'm Brendan Lee, and I'm the chairman of the Department of Molecular Human Genetics here at Baylor College of Medicine. We're in Houston, Texas, in the largest medical center in the world. And um, I, I'm going to kick this off to tell you about all the exciting things uh, in this field, and then you'll hear from the, you know, the, the folks who are doing the work. Um, next slide, please, Deborah. So, you know, when we think about the word genetics, there are really many faces. And, and if you Google it or Wikipedia, it, genetics is really a branch of biology that deals with heredity and variation of organisms. Next slide, please. Um, but when you really think about it, genetics is really an approach to a problem. And genomics, as you've heard, is actually the modern language of genetics. And I think empowers solutions. Now, the medical practice of genetics is, I think, the implementation of those solutions. And as you can, you, you may have seen from the opportunities in the previous slide, it is a medical practice um, where you can participate in diagnosis, counseling, and treatment. So it really covers the whole range. So genetics is really a, an integrating strategy. In, and at its very core, it's an approach to studying a basic mechanism or disease. Um, and... In the context of medical genetics, it's a clinical service as well as an educational approach. And then in the context of laboratory diagnosis, we can use molecular approaches, cytogenetic approaches, or biochemical approaches to make actual disease diagnoses. And ultimately, and this is the most exciting thing, it's really led to development and testing of treatments. It's now um, you know, a treatment intervention. You know, I mentioned that genomics is the modern language of genetics. And this means that we're using genomics as a tool for deciphering, understanding, and applying genetic information. And that is to decode uh, our underlying genetic information, which is encompassed by 3 billion bases. I think many of you must have learned about this in your genetics classes. And they encode over 20,000 genes. Um, and there's a lot of dark matter we're learning about. Now, that code is even more complicated. And this is why, you know, it is... A, rapidly evolving field. It's an RNA code. The DNA code is converted to an RNA code and there are over 100,000 isoforms that derive from these 20,000 genes. And that's just what we know about. And then you add to that the epigenetic code. So changes by our environment to the DNA. So this complexity is enormous and this is why it's so exciting. We 
because every day we're learning something new. And it's probably the most rapidly evolving um, medical specialty. So what is this term precision medicine? This is really um, um, this idea that I think has really been put forth and advanced at a national level by President Obama's All of Us initiatives. But it's the idea of in individualizing medical care to advance human health. You know, when you think about all this stuff about clinical trials and, you know, obviously with the COVID epidemic and all the trials that go into informing when a drug is approved, it's all done at a population level, which is appropriate and the right thing to do. But genomics and genetics also takes that to a next step of, well, can we take that population data and then really apply it at an individual data? You know, who will get... Um, adverse and significant effects from a COVID vaccine, for example. And that's just one simple example of what personalized genomics can be informative about. So the pro promise of this idea of personalized medicine is to reduce shotgun medicine, meaning you give one pill for one disease for everybody, even though 30% of individuals may not respond to that pill. Um, so you integrate genomic information and genetic information for standard care it allows us to stratify population management. So we don't look at the population as one. Um, it informs lifestyle management, prevention and screening, and ultimately, of course, the ultimate promise, individualized therapy. We may be able to be able to target therapies to make things more e effective, um, to have less toxicity, uh, and also at the same time, importantly for our society, reduce downstream clinical court cost. And that will lead to reduce cost overall, which is a very important part of, of health disparities. And so when you think about rapidly growing clinical applications in precision medicine, you know, this is a slide where the number of stars sort of, you know, uh, emphasize where it's happening a lot already. No question that the most, you know, impact has been in pediatric Mendelian disorders. So birth defects, trying to understand the genetic causes of birth defects and by diagnosing them, um, can we help prevention and management. Reproductive health. You know, what are the risks to a woman and her partner in having a child and in that child? So that's another example. Who are carriers of specific diseases, for example? Cancer prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Actually making um, diagnoses in cancers based on not just pathology, but also molecular mutations, but then leading to targeted treatments, drugs that actually work because of the presence of certain genetic mutations. Less so, but an enormous opportunity is adult risk. You know, who's going to be at risk for more severe diabetes or hypertension? Um, and how do we manage that risk? And then also undiagnosed diseases, lots of diseases out there which are not simply labeled, but then using genetics and genomics to try to diagnose them. So these, this is all sort of the exciting things that are going on in personalized medicine as it applies to genetics and genomics. And one of the really exciting places this is happening, and this is where now I'll tell you a little bit about us, is in the Texas Medical Center. So this is the largest medical center in the world. And I'm sitting here right now at Baylor College of Medicine, which is a free sustaining health sciences university. And we happen to also house the largest genetics department in the world. And I think uh, many of us think the leading genetics department. And our goal is to transform medicine with the practice of science of genetics and genomics. And I think our peers think of us as one of the top genetics and genomics programs in the world. We are an integrated operation in the sense that we are a basic science department, a clinical department, a diagnostic pathology department, and we're very entrepreneurial. What's really important to us and why we're here talking with you is that educational activities bridge all of our divisions research, clinical, and diagnostic. And that this is a main goal of us, of our, our department. And that education is steeped in the research approach to genetics. And as you'll see, we have been the leading genetics department in terms of NIH funding for many, many years now. But it's also one of the largest clinical departments with over 12,000 visits, clinical visits per year. And this is where trainees get an opportunity to learn how to be a genetics doctor. And our diagnostic lab joint venture has also enormous value over 100,000 year, year, 100, samples a year, where we're again taking samples from the patient to try to make omics type diagnoses to help the patient. And at, led by Deborah and Susan, our community engagement and outreach has um, been a big part of what we do for many years. And again, why we're delighted to see you here. Um, this is an example just in recent years of our 
peers and our funding. This is important because it really drives home the message that, you know, doing research and, and, and being at the cutting edge of genetics and genomics research is how you deliver the best care. And one example of that is the most recent time the NIH has uh, done a, a review of the most important genomic medicine discoveries. Two of the top 10 were either led or co-led by our department, um, one in the area of undiagnosed diseases and the other in the area of continued reanalysis of genetic information and making a diagnosis. And so what you really see is that when you're participating in genetics and genomics, you're really at this riding this leading edge of, of, of a wave of innovation. And you know there are a lot of great things in medicine and in science, but I think uh, hopefully you'll get the message that genetics and genomics is one of the most exciting and rapidly growing fields. And I think I'm gonna then turn it back over to Deborah. And next is Dr. Reed Sutton, and I'll put the slides up. Okay, thank, thanks Deborah. So um, just a quick background. So uh, again, I work here at the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. I'm actually physically sitting at Texas Children's Hospital, um, which is our main pediatric teaching hospital. And I'm the director of our residency and fellowship programs. I'm from Kentucky originally, went to medical school there, and then did a pediatric residency uh, at Washington University and St. Louis Children's Hospital. And then came here um, over two decades ago now for my genetics training and have stayed on as faculty. Uh, uh, presently, my primary clinical and clinical research interests are in skeletal dysplasias and inborn errors of metabolism, as well as syndrome discovery and identification. I get to do a lot of fun things at work all the time or as part of work. Uh, and today I'm gonna just kind of give you uh, one example. Um, next slide, please, Deborah. <clears throat> so as, uh, what do geneticists do? We evaluate and treat individuals with rare diseases of all ages. Uh, and again, as Brendan uh, mentioned, our goal is to advance patient care and knowledge through translational research. Uh, as he had mentioned, while uh, certainly over the past few decades, uh, new technologies have improved our ability to diagnose and treat individuals with rare diseases. Uh, uh, there still is significant ongoing unmet need. Uh, and so we believe that in bringing the best care to our patients, it's not just to deliver what's presently standard of care, but to define a new standard of care uh, through research. Uh, and this includes things like gene phenotype discoveries, where we're identifying the genetic cause of an individual's problems. Um, often, and I'll give you an example in a moment, working with individuals and groups with rare disorders to under, uh, identify underlying pathophysiology and new treatments, as well as clinical trials uh, to improve uh, their health. Next slide, please, Deborah. So just kind of one example of something I've been fortunate to be involved with, uh, the patient advocacy group for osteogenesis imperfecta, which is the most common genetic form of brittle bone disease. Um, they decided a number of years ago uh, that they wanted to try to advance knowledge about OI and to uh, hopefully identify new treatments. And so the, they did a fundraising uh, with their constituents uh, in order to form a group of uh, uh, coordinated or linked clinical research centers across the United States. Uh, and I was the co-director of this project along with Peter Byers, who's at the University of Washington. This was initially at three sites uh, and then expanded to six centers across North America. Um, and we uh, started with a natural history study. And Building upon this, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Lee, uh, uh, we applied for funding from the National Institutes of Health through their rare disease clinical research uh, network. Next slide, please, Deborah. And so the National Institutes of Health now funds uh, over two dozen rare disease clinical research networks. You can see that we are one of them as the Brittle Bone Diseases Consortium but there are a whole host of uh, uh, other rare diseases that you can see here that are part of the consortia. 
next slide, please, Deborah. Um, this is a, a, a screenshot of our website. Uh, if you'd like to uh, go look at the details of various things uh, that, that we have going on, uh, but I'll, on the next slide, tell you about just a few of them. Oh, sorry, the next, next slide. So this is just the sites across North America. You see the, uh, uh, we have again, kind of a, a, a close to a dozen sites now across North America. Uh, now, I think on the next slide, I'll kind of give you a brief overview. Um, all of the rare disease clinical research network have a series of longitudinal studies or natural history studies. In ours, we're specifically looking at um, um, vertebral compression fractures, the frequency and the impact that it has on health and mobility, looking at scoliosis or curvature of the spine, and again, assessing the progression impacts that this has and uh, uh, effects of various treatments that are commonly employed, and as well as uh, dental and craniofacial health and oral quality of life, NOI. Uh, we also uh, completed a phase one uh, drug study um, of an anti-TGF beta antibody recently. We are getting ready to start um, a clinical trial uh, in individuals with severe OI that have significant um, uh, dental malalignment with an Invisalign clinical trial, as well as a study of pain, anxiety, and, and mental health. So uh, again, very fortunate to have NIH funding. And they're, again, it's, we're looking at not just bones, but uh, dental, um, orthodontic, um, mental health, and all sorts of things through the collaborative efforts. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, you can see we have funding from a bunch of different uh, sources, including uh, various institutes at the National Institutes of Health and the OI Foundation. Next slide, please, Deborah. And then um, also for rare diseases, uh, many of these have patient advocacy groups associated with them, uh, and they do a variety of things. I've mentioned the fundraising the OI Foundation did for the initial linked clinical research centers, but they also fundraise to supplement from our National Institutes of Health grant funding for the Brittle Bone Disease Consortium. Uh, 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 Brendan and I serve on the Medical Advisory Council for the Osteogenesis Imperfecta Foundation. Uh, they have a national conference every two years that I regularly attend um, and will give talks to patients and families, do medical consultations. Uh, the pictures on the right are showing a fundraiser they had um, uh, uh, right about two years ago, uh, where we all got, uh, you can see there are a bunch of us uh, healthcare providers and researchers in OI kind of uh, sitting around there outdoors. Uh, and we raised money uh, by getting people to uh, pledge to pay us to walk 50 miles uh, on a weekend along the CNO um, path in the Baltimore, DC area. Um, so again, kind of lots of fun to not only work with advocacy groups to help out their constituents, but also um, uh, work with colleagues uh, to do things like raise money and, and help out foundations. And then finally, um, going to professional society meetings and again, um, uh, meetings related to OI or other skeletal dysplasias. I've just listed a few great places um, in the past few years uh, that we've had meetings. So also um, uh, fun to travel and, and uh, meet friend, meet international friends and colleagues at, at these meetings. Um, and then the last slide, just briefly, Deborah had mentioned training options. So we do have combined residencies in pediatrics and internal medicine and medical genetics and genomics. These are four-year programs where individuals are coming out of medical school and entering into these training programs and at completion, they're eligible for board certification in both. For individuals who are coming from, let's say, do another residency such as OBGYN first, uh, there's a two-year categorical training um, in medical genetics and genomics. Uh, and then for those, again, who have done um, uh, or interested in maternal fetal medicine and medical genetics and genomics, we have a program for that as well. And that would be after completion of a, a obstetrics and gynecology residency. So I think those are all the slides I have. Turn it over to Lindsay. 
Okay, so um, I'm uh, Dr. Lindsay Burridge. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics, and I also um, see patients as, all, as well as do research. And my interest areas are similar to Dr. Sutton's in metabolic disorders, skeletal disorders, and undiagnosed diseases. But I guess to step back a little bit, um, I was born and raised in Louisiana and uh, did my um, undergraduate work at Tulane University where I did a, a degree in cell and molecular biology. At the time I was interested in, in medical school and I was told by my pre-med advisor that I really needed to do some research. And so um, she recommended that I go downtown to the medical school and drop off as many resumes as I could and, and just hope that someone um, called me back. And I got very fortunate that a group of medical geneticists at Tulane um, called me back and interviewed me and offered me a position uh, for a summer as a summer student in their department. And what made it even better is that it was paid. And as a daughter of two school teachers, um, I wasn't sure how I was going to survive the summer without a paid position. So it worked out quite nicely. And what I didn't realize at the time was that this summer student research position would open me up to the, my new career path. So I fell in love with medical genetics at Tulane and um, realized that I really wanted to go to medical school, but also to get some research training because there were so many um, gaps in our knowledge about medical genetics. And I thought maybe I could get involved in research as well as clinical care. So I moved up to Ohio in order to pursue my MD and PhD. Um, this was a big move for me. My first plane flight ever was my uh, flight up to Ohio to interview. Um, but I really liked it up there and ended up staying to, uh, for, to complete a pediatric residency. And then I came back down south closer to home to Houston to finish my medical genetics training um, as well as biochemical genetics fellowship. And there's a lot of reasons why I really enjoy uh, medical genetics. Um, one is that our field requires a lot of medical detective work. Um, with our patients that we see, um, in many cases, we can't make a diagnosis on the day of that first visit. But if we spend time and, and really um, pursue um, research in some cases, we can come up with a diagnosis where, where we couldn't before. And so I'll tell you just one example of a case where we did just that. I um, mean, I think, because I think it highlights um, what I enjoy most about this specialty. So this was a former preemie who was quite small, had been small during the pregnancy and was small at the time that we saw her. She had been hospitalized because she wasn't growing well. Um, but in addition, she had very small ears and had hearing loss. You can go to the next slide. Well, we did a very careful history and we did a very detailed physical exam. And in addition to being really small, we noticed that she had some very distinctive features. So she had some distinctive facial features. You can notice she had some full lips, her eyes um, were down slanted, um, she had a prominent forehead, she had the small ears. We also noticed um, that she didn't have any kneecaps, um, as you can see in the photograph below. And these features you can um, advance, the, the small size, the small ears, also called microtia, and the absent patella or kneecaps suggested to us a diagnosis called meyer gorlin syndrome. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, but we did genetic testing for meyer gorlin syndrome. At the time, there were five genes um, known to be associated with this diagnosis. And when we sent genetic testing, we did not find any mutations or variants in the five known genes for meyer gorlin syndrome. So we brought these negative results back to the family but it didn't change our diagnosis. We felt certain she had meyer gorlin syndrome, but we suspected that she had a new cause, uh, a new gene that had not yet been associated um, with this disorder. And in order to figure that out, we went back to her exome sequencing. We went back to her DNA um, and looked at it more closely. Now I hadn't done that ever before, um, but folks here taught me how to do that, how to look at the letters in her DNA and sort out um, if maybe there was something hidden in there that we just hadn't discovered yet. You can go to the next slide. So what we knew so far is that there had been five genes associated with meyer gorlin syndrome. And the proteins encoded by this gene are shown with the white lettering on the slide. All of them were important for the pre-replication complex, which is important in DNA replication. So when we looked at her DNA very carefully, we found that she had a de novo variant in a gene called Geminin, G-M-N-N. -N. And this gene encodes a protein that interacts with CDT1, a known Meyer-Gorlin syndrome gene. 
and we were pretty certain we had the cause. You can go to the next slide. So this variant was present in our patient, but not in either parent or in her sister. Next slide. And what we think was happening is that it's a very early, uh, it's a change very early in the gene. Um, you can see the nomenclature on the top of the slide. It affects the sixth amino acid in the protein and it converts it to a stop codon. And what we think was happening was that the body was using a new start codon and thus the protein that was made was missing the first uh, chunk of the protein. Now, in order to prove that a gene is causing a disease or a disorder, we have to find additional patients. And we were really worried that we weren't gonna find any more patients with a spelling change or a mutation in the DNA in this very specific part of the gene, because we felt that it had to occur in this very specific region um, to use this new methionine um, as a start and to cause the, fe the features. You can go to the next slide. Because variants in only a very small region of the gene would be expected to cause this disorder. You can go to the next slide. But with some persistence and with some patients from the family, we several years later identified two additional patients. These were patients identified by some physicians in the Netherlands who were interested in Meyer-Gorlin syndrome. Both of these patients have similar uh, variants in the gene, and they also are predicted to um, cause the body to use this uh, a other start codon and make a, trunk, a, a protein that's smaller than it should be. What was striking to us was how closely these patients resembled each other, particularly the first patient at the top of the slide and our patient at the bottom of the slide. They're not related, um, but we had shown a photo of the patient at the top of the slide from a medical journal to our patient's family at the time of her diagnosis um, because we thought they had such striking features, only to learn several years later that not only did they have the same diagnosis, but very similar uh, variants in their DNA causing the syndrome. You can go to the next slide. So I like to tell this story because it highlights many of the reasons I really enjoy medical genetics. So um, not only does medical, does the discovery of this a variant in this uh, patient's DNA, it helps us to provide a precise diagnosis for the family and gen genetic counseling for her, for her and her family. But it also teaches us uh, very important lessons about the impact of mutations and genes involved in a critical process in the cell, such as DNA replication. In addition, it, it teaches about persistence. Persistence is, is important for making diagnoses. With time, new technologies come out that we're able to take advantage of. And if, if patients are interested, like our patient, they can enroll in research studies. And, and over time, we often can come back to patients with diagnoses um, using these research approaches, um, which is very important for advancing the field. And then lastly, I, I really enjoy the international collaboration. Um, international collaboration is key for understanding rare disease we reach out to folks across the US as well as across the globe all the time in order to help us take better care of patients. And folks in our field are very collaborative and they're always happy to help. All right. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I'm Kevin Lynch. I'm a clinical geneticist here in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics. Um, and I want to talk to you guys about what life is actually like on a day-to-day -day basis, because I think for a lot of people, when they first hear about genetics, it's kind of obscure, you know, what things we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so a little bit about me first. So I am from the Bahamas, actually, um, born and bred there, my family still lives there. I grew up interested in all kinds of different things, but I gravitated primarily to science and chemistry, so that's what I majored in in college. And actually, I, like Lindsay, got involved with a lot of research in my undergraduate years. And so eventually went and did a graduate degree in chemistry. And then after that, went back to medical school because I really enjoyed working with patients and people and the human interactions. Um, after that, I did a pediatrics residency. And it was there that I first saw firsthand, you know, what life was like as a medical geneticist in my pediatrics training. And I saw, you know, in my mentor, um, the way that his kind of day-to-day -day life blended his clinical work with his research and his teaching. And I kind of wanted my career to mirror his in some way. Um, and that's what kind of brought me here. So next slide. 
So we got a little bit of a glimpse of Dr. Lee's schedule. This is what my schedule actually looks like. And you will see there's some gaps, but actually there are not many gaps in reality. So next slide. Um, so I spend about 40% uh, of my time um, on the adult side. So I work at our Harris County Health System Clinic. Um, this is the health system set up by the county um, as a safety net for all individuals, those without insurance, with little insurance, undocumented individuals, et cetera. And so we see adult patients referred for any and all genetic indications. So anything from an early onset breast cancer or colon cancer to I've seen adults with familial you know, ALS, um, a lot of different neurologic syndromes, it really anything that can walk into the door to maybe have a genetic basis. And I really, you know, I didn't think I would, at first would enjoy this as much, but I really have learned to really value and enjoy my time there because it is a very diverse population, number one, but it's also a very underserved population. You know, a lot of my patients that I see there don't have a lot of resources. Any kind of resource you can think of, not just financial, but, you know, educational resources, social resources. So they don't have a lot of understanding about genetics and how important it can be for their lives. And I really enjoy the time I get to spend with them, teaching them about what we do, why it's important for them and their health and how we can help them moving forward. So next slide. I spend the other approximately 30% of my time here at Texas Children's Between inpatient clinics and outpatient or inpatient work and outpatient clinics. And in our clinics, we also similarly see a huge or broad range of patient indications. So primarily here, we see children for things like developmental delays, um, known or unknown, you know, genetic disorders like chromosomal abnormalities, um, copy number variants, rare skeletal dysplasias, any number of different um, indications. We also have specialty clinics here at Texas Children's, and I participate in one of those, which is our metabolic clinic, where we see patients with inborn errors of metabolism. We just finished clinic actually about an hour ago, <laughs> which is why I'm still in my office. Um, and we th that clinic actually I love most because it gives us a chance to have some continuity of care with patients. So these are patients with metabolic disorders that require some form of treatment, whether that be dietary management, medications, et cetera, usually for the rest of their life. And we get to see them from essentially birth when they're first diagnosed on newborn screening up until in some cases they don't wanna see us or they age out or wanna to go to an adult um, practitioner if that's their preference. So it's been also very rewarding and we see just a ton of different patients for that. Next slide. Uh, this is the part where I didn't really have a lot of kind of grasp of when I first became a medical student, like inpatient side, what does genetics do on an inpatient basis? And it's actually a very busy and fulfilling service we, we provide. So we have as attendings or physicians um, call that we do. Every one of us has some weeks of call throughout the year where we see inpatient consults. And these are patients either in the ICUs or the neonatal ICUs who present and at that time don't have a known genetic diagnosis, but have some feature that their physicians feel may, may, might have a genetic basis. So that can be anything from a newborn who has abnormal facial features or dysmorphic features, we call it, um, to an older teenage patient who's presenting in an abnormal way um, with, you know, strokes or muscle disease, et cetera. Um, we, being at Texas Children's Hospital, it's a large hospital, have a very busy inpatient consult service, so it can be very busy, but I do enjoy it because it's an opportunity to kind of channel your inner Sherlock Holmes and really kind of figure out the puzzle pieces and what you think might actually be going on and what tests you might think is best or most appropriate for that patient. On the inpatient side is also where we manage and sort of treat our patients with inborn errors of metabolism. So whenever these patients get sick, they often require, you know, supportive therapies like IV fluids or different emergency medications. So they come in often through our emergency room when we see them there. We also transition them upwards to the floor and then the ICUs if that's appropriate. Um, and so we would follow them on a day-to-day -day basis while they're inpatient and see them and also help with their management. Next slide. And then, like I said, the rest of my time is split between teaching and research. And I have about 30% of my time that's split between those two. And teaching, I think, you know, doesn't just include actual formal lectures to medical students. 
Um, it also includes teaching on the fly. So we have pediatrics residents who rotate with us. We also have genetic counseling students, genetics trainees, and graduate students who will rotate with us or that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we do also have opportunities to do formal lecture style teaching to medical students and graduate students. And I've been able to do that and develop my skills as a teacher in that way. Unfortunately, in the last year and a half, it's been a lot of it through Zoom, which is has its pluses and minuses, but, but it's also been good to learn how to adjust to that and how to you know, make use of the technology in a different way. Next slide. And so research, this is where I spend about, like I said, 15 or so percent of my time. And I you know, don't do a lot of laboratory research myself. I like to focus on clinically or translational research, we call it, where we're taking what we see in a lab or what we see you know, developed and try and bring that to the patient or to the bedside. So I'm actually working on a couple of clinical trials with Dr. Sutton using RNA therapies or targeted therapies. I'm also working on a couple of other clinical trials with another physician in our clinic on cells as and using targeted therapies to treat those. I'm also involved in a lot of different projects on the better management of patients with Bonaire's metabolism and seeing if we can optimize their care in any way. And then I also have a clinical interest in new or undiagnosed or neurodevelopmental disorders. So really describing these new syndromes and what they involve and how they're inherited, et cetera. Next slide. So, you know, I hope we've, you've all gotten a sense already of why I in particular think genetics is great. I mean, it's really a field that impacts every branch of medicine and it has very much real world implications, even though people don't often think that it would. It is constantly changing and evolving. And for someone like me that has lots of different interests and likes to keep my hands in different pots, it's really engaging. It keeps me engaged and excited to come to work and learn every day. It definitely makes use of the latest in technology, technological advances in every different form. And it can provide you with ample opportunity to not only provide clinical care, but really flex those other muscles in your brain, like research or teaching or you know, quality improvement. There's so many different avenues you can go down in this field. And I think it's been so rewarding, even though oh, I've only been doing it for about two-ish years or so it's been attending. You know, it makes me excited to keep going and to have a long and successful career. So all right. So uh, my name is Matt Snyder. I'm one of the fourth year combined peds genetics residents here at Baylor. Um, and I'll just kind of tell you my story of how I, I came to this program and um, or came into the field of genetics. Um, so this is a picture of me when I was uh, three years old. I had a bone marrow transplant for a rare immune deficiency called Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome. And so the reason I put this up here is because my it's part of my story, but also my, my family growing up told me stories of the immunologists, the transplant doctors who guided them through my journey. Um, gave them hope in times of fear, communicated information about my condition to them. Um, and so this is what pushed me to pursue medicine, but I grew up in a, a small town in the center of rural Pennsylvania. Um, and to me, like being a physician meant you were a pediatrician, you were an orthopedic surgeon, or you were just a regular adult doctor. And so um, it wasn't until later that I realized how big the field of medicine was. You can go to the next slide. So uh, other than school, uh, the rest of my time, uh, and so I was in my early 20s through college, uh, was spent wrestling. And I, and I put this up here because unlike uh, Dr. Glinton and Dr. Burge, I, I didn't have a strong research background or even a, a really deep, deep experience in the sciences before even medical school. Um, and so I, I put this up here as a way to just show you all that you can come to genetics through different paths. Um, you might have a strong research background and, and really love that and want to run with that the rest of your career. And that's awesome. But you might not have much at all. And, and that, that shouldn't be a limiting factor. And it wasn't for me. And I, I realized that even at, still at this point in my training, there's so much more I, I have to learn um, and how now I'm getting more excited about research. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, and then you can advance to the next picture as well. Um, so I went to med school in uh, the DC area. And again, this is, I use this again to stress that med school wasn't the easiest, uh, the easiest thing for me, the, the, 
what I uh, spent the majority of time doing was studying um, and then exploring the nation's capital. I didn't spend a lot of time doing research or, or many other things. Um, <clears throat> so again, just to highlight that um, uh, I didn't, I, I'm still in this field and getting to pursue this awesome career without having a strong research background before um, stepping foot here. And um, um, uh, so I, I just wanna use that again as a sense of an encouragement for people that might have various backgrounds on the call here. Um, but then as you go to the next slide, um, during, it was during med school, I had friends uh, who were actually outside of medicine and not in medicine. Um, who kept bringing up the field of genetics to me and what their thoughts were on, on recent advancements with genetic technology. Um, and I really didn't have much of a response to them because um, I didn't get a, a robust training in genetics um, in, in the first couple of years of, of medical school, um, but they, it definitely piqued my interest. And so you can go to the next slide. And this is, uh, I put this up here is because this is, uh, the urea cycle, which probably for many of you is the, the bane of your step one um, experience. Um, but um, <clears throat> my first patient that um, I got to see when I, I did an elective rotation um, at the Children's Hospital in DC uh, was a, a newborn with OTC deficiency, one of the urea cycle disorders. Um, <clears throat> and this was the first time in my young medical career at that point that I really got the sense the the combination of fear and hope that a family had um, that was able to like really relate to the stories that my parents told me growing up. Um, and so uh, being somewhat on the other side of the curtain of discussing a rare disease with a family, um, not just wanted me to, or didn't just motivate me to learn how to communicate this information to them. It, it motivated me to just go and learn as much as I could about these conditions. Um, and so this is what really sparked my interest um, into wanting to pursue this field um, and, uh, and then go into a residency in, in medical genetics. And you can go to the, the next slide. And so now in residency, this is a, a picture of uh, a patient I had on the pediatric service um, who had a, a condition called IgA nephropathy. He was in the hospital for over 100 days, and I got to be his primary um, provider for the last week and a half of his hospitalization. And, and what I love about this picture, this story, is um, really what I love about the field of genetics is learning the intricacies of a rare condition, understanding it for myself, understanding how to take care of it as a provider, but then also explaining it to families in ways that they can understand um, because we only get to be with them for moments, right? Um, even if we're taking care of them in, in continuity, we only get to be with them through those brief moments during clinic. So we really need to be able to equip families and, and patients to understand their conditions um, through a variety of different um, cultural language, racial context. Um, and so that's what I think is the most challenging thing about um, the field for me, but it's also the most exciting thing. And you can go to the last slide. I think I cut you off, so oh, you no, just have to no, explain it. No, that's, that's, I just had a little summary slide that, you know, just oh, highlighting, okay. you know, we all come in to this field with different stories. Mine is the one that I had a rare condition and found an emotional connection. And now I, I love kind of um, being able to, to really deeply learn about these conditions and then explain them to families in, in ways that they can understand. Um, and so I just want to give that as a, as a sign of encouragement that we all come into this field uh, um, with different backgrounds. And so I, I hope that whatever your background is, is it doesn't limit you from um, considering a field in genetics. Well, thank you so much. All of them are just uh, uh, extraordinary. Uh, interactions with the patients and the passion that they have. And for me, it feels like each of you want to take these people home and just love on them until everything gets better. <laughs> so if, if being a, a detective and a doctor all in one is, is your goal, I, I think 
everyone kind of get a great understanding of what it really means to be a medical geneticist. I put this slide up because we do have an outreach opportunity for um, students like yourselves and families around the country to learn about different genetic conditions and diseases. Each month we have Evenings with Genetics and it's an outreach opportunity for the families, it's geared toward families to understand about these various diseases and conditions. But in plain language, there is a geneticist, uh, there's a clinical geneticist and then there's the um, laboratory geneticist and a family member who will describe what it is to have that particular condition. And this is also on our website and I'm sure uh, Susan has put that up as well. And so we encourage you to attend those sessions to find out more about anything you've been interested in. We try to cover a broad range of uh, topics. 